Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 1107. This is the policy committee, uh, Frederick County Public Schools. Um, we have uh, draft minutes from February 26th, 2020 to approve. Uh, do I hear any uh, questions about anything on the minutes? So we have consensus approval for the minutes. Thank you very much, gets us started. Uh, before we look at the rest of the agenda, I'd like to ask uh, the committee members to allow, we have one public comment and it's appropriate to our 1.08 religious expression. And I would like to read the public comment just prior to our discussion of that, if that's acceptable to the committee. Yes, sir. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Cannon, uh, I think our first topic is uh, 1.03. Policy 508. Well, and this was, again, in our journey of updating and formatting our policies in accordance with the um, plan of the policy committee. So this was when we began discussion, then we asked um, Dr. Chambers, our director of special ed, to review and provide input and to be available in case you had some questions relative to this. So you can look at the primary changes are editorial and updating in nature. And so with that, I'll just toss it back to you to see if you had some specific questions or edits or additional information that you would like us to include for this policy. Um, I was happy to see that the link worked to get to the special education uh, handbook uh, that's at the bottom. Thank you mm -hmm. very much for making that happen. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure that our links work regularly and including them in our policies as often as possible. I, I didn't have any other um, comments on this. Colleagues? I, um, I also appreciated the update to the special education handbook itself. Um, so I, um, I know that that handbook is big and it has lots of links in it, so it's best accessed um, electronically is that is that link given to parents I guess if we're going to reference a handbook that's that's what I'm wondering about you know I know there's the parental rights and the habilitative stuff that's given to special ed parents but there's a lot of good information in here mm -hmm. but the audiences for the handbook itself seem a little bit varied to me it seems like an internal document, but it also seems like it has external purposes. So I just, I guess I'd wonder how that works. That's a great question, Liz. I would say that um, a couple things. It lives on our board facing fcps.org special education parent resource page. Um, we can certainly have the link available um, on our IEP survey card that we provide digitally. That's a great suggestion. And additionally, um, the communication that we send out to parents will include that the handbook is available for their review at this link. We'll most definitely do that. Um, your question or your comment is, um, is, not, is not unique in that um, the requirement of special education handbooks as presented by the state of Maryland require us to provide the same information in an, a way that allows us to have staff, community, and family see the same information. And so we tried, um, and we did very uniquely, we're able to put together a work group before the school closure as early as last summer that had families, school staff, we simplified process, and we updated the handbook into this e-handbook. Um, so I do agree that it would be very thoughtful to have this link be available in any communication that we provide to families um, moving forward. Thank you. Um, so with that, Mr. Beninsky, if I could just get some direction from you. Um, is it the policy committee's preference that we now schedule this for work session as a first reading or do you want to I, I guess I'm I don't know if the board has changed direction at the last direction we had we were trying to streamline and minimize um, dialogue related topics to the extent we could as long as the board continues to meet virtually 
I'm fine either way. I, I think this could be very quickly addressed, just like the bid items are, but just wanted to see what's the preference of the policy committee so we can schedule it accordingly. I think this one um, is, doesn't, isn't really controversial. It doesn't have a lot of edits to it, so I think it could go right to consent, and everybody could be advised that they can, of course, pull it from consent uh, to okay. ask questions. I, is that acceptable? For tonight? No. Oh, no. Oh, for, oh yeah. No, okay. for, for <laughs> next next okay. meeting okay. or one in the future. Okay. Go on consent and can be pulled. Okay. Thank you. I think that'll help. Okay. And then the next item, again, was one that we had for discussion um, before we were canceled March 25th. Okay. There's, um, so now we just, just need to do a little kick her out and invite him up. <laughs> Um, so Kevin Kendro is here, and if you, and Kevin, if you're comfortable with just highlighting some of the reasons um, that we provided some edits for the board discussion, for the policy committee discussion. Sure. Good morning. Um, under the policy statement, um, we added what we would say is an additional why reasoning for extracurricular activities. That is, the extracurricular activities promote student engagement. That um, those two sentences are there. And then from an equity standpoint, we also added in where it says this policy promotes equity of access. And then we state that um, it reflects courses taken through dual enrollment virtual and summer school sessions. And this is something that we are looking at updating our regulation that is tied to this policy. That's why this was included as a policy statement. Any questions on those two items? No. Thank okay. you. Okay. Moving down to the definition, again, um, for extracurricular activities, we just wanted to provide in, in kind of updated language, a clarification there of what extracurricular, extracurricular activities are in FCPS. And this was all done through our academic eligibility committee, and we do have um, Ms. Shipman here, Ms. Chappelle, and Dr. Lippy. Okay. Well, I noticed that 509.2 uh, was struck through and that seems to be the same language that's in uh, the regulation that's, that's referenced, 500-24. Is it exactly the same? We felt that the, um, again, I have other committee members if you want to um, chime in here, but that this policy did not need to incorporate all the language that was right. in the regulation. So our academic standards for participation in extracurricular activities will be reflected in regulation 524, but we felt it was not needed in this policy. Well, I agree, I, and I, I appreciate that you referenced it. It would be nice if it was a link, mm -hmm. make it a link so that it's a hot link so you can, mm -hmm. uh, parents can just click on it and find out, and students as well. We can do that. Would you like me to move on to page two? Oh, sorry, that's where I was. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, I apologize. That's okay. I didn't um, have anything with page one. Did anybody else? Okay, sorry. Oh, no, thank you. Um, again, just updated, um, instead of the deputy superintendent, we changed that to the superintendent's designee. Mm -hmm. And then again, updating and clarifying what co-curricular programs and activities are, the um, letter D on the top of page two. Mm -hmm. And then as uh, Mr. Boniski just referenced, taking out all the language that is currently in our academic standards for participation regulation, taking that out of this policy and having um, a link. And I believe that is everything. Well, I'm very comfortable with, with how this looks right now, but in, in the wake of this tsunami that is 2020 and the fact that we've gone to possible digital and virtual co-curriculars and extracurriculars, uh, I just, I wonder if this is a place where we should reference how we address them in the digital world. I mean, maybe not. I, I just don't know that that's necessary right now, but it's, right. we're looking at the philosophy or the policy, at, not the regulation of how we would implement it, but mm -hmm. what the philosophy or policy of our board would be in a digital age in addressing these issues, which you unfortunately have had to do mm -hmm. in, in the last couple of weeks. We kind of put you in that position. So, so Mike, if I could just um, ju jump in because we could say that about a lot of our policies, some yeah. of our regs. And so one, um, one of the recommendations of the reopening subcommittee was to 
identify how the policy committee wants us to proceed as far as what we're doing at Superintendent's Advisory Council is we're proceeding with updating regs as though we're in that environment that we're going to revert to normal. But also then we have to identify and issue a statement that we recognize and we're tracking what ones have been modified or waived for operational reasons during the pandemic. And so we actually had that as a topic to bring to the policy committee to determine what will be our recommendation to the board as it relates to do you want to revise any policies that you feel you know would be important do we want to make a policy-based decision that we recognize during the pandemic that not all things are going to be applicable um, because there's so many our, our subcommittee right. took it by the 100 200 300 400 500 and we would literally be changing hundreds of regs for half a year all year um, but we do recognize, it's almost like one of those little disclaimers. We recognize that some of these policies and regs may not be applicable during the pandemic. And so that, that was one of the things that we decided to do with Superintendent's Advisory, that we still want to update our regs um, to reflect updates, best practices, but, you know, with that, that ca caveat established. So I yeah. think of the same type of policy related statement that we might put on the board's website under policies but that was one thing we wanted to share today to determine if we maybe want to make a recommendation to the full board um, uh, that was one thing of the folks what do you think I was thinking about this in reference to you know the we had um, we had many hours of deliberation and presentations about school start times mm -hmm. and what has held the board back from making adjustments to those is budget, transportation, mm -hmm. the number of buses. But in the COVID environment, mm -hmm. school start times are able to change. Mm -hmm. And I understand mm -hmm. right now that they, they are going to change a little bit. So, um, you know, seat hours is reg and policy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's a lot of things that have adjusted. I guess, you know, to have to asterisk every policy and say, I mean, it's like the act of, it's, it's an act of God clause on your right. insurance policy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's what we're All doing. this applies except when there's an act of God. Yeah, policy. so, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess our job is maybe not to asterisk every single one of our policies or to have and in case of cover sheet, perhaps our job is to have a pandemic or emergency plan that we're continually revising to say, you know, this is the MOU, these are the MOUs we'll need to have in place. These are the, um, the, waivers. the policy waivers that we're gonna need to have, which mm -hmm. is, so if we're doing the equity framework all the time, that would be one guiding piece to say, so if we're gonna start offering extracurricular activities or co-curricular activities, which I think you've done a great job with. Thank you. Um, the guidance that came out yesterday from your group was, was spot on, it was really good. Uh, I thought Thank it was you. really clear and helpful. Um, you know, that you do it, we're taking our equity policy, which never changes, mm -hmm. and we're applying that you know, to say when we start opening up things, we're still going to use these same, mm -hmm. these same guiding principles, mm -hmm. even though we can't do everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our bus policy doesn't apply except for maybe the small groups that are coming back. But right. in the case of this, I think that it's kind of being done naturally. But that would go to me as best practices in a, in a, um, a like a playbook going mm -hmm. forward for how you deal with the next time we have a situation like this. Mm. Yeah. You know. Well, and I think right now we do have a statement in the reopening plan that says policies, regs, and negotiated agreements may have clauses in there that will not apply and will be addressed by waivers or MOUs. So we do have like, a, you know, that, that kind of statement. And so right now then we're evaluating policies that may, you may want to look at and make waivers or changes. Um, one was, uh, uh, just give me an example off the top of my head because we were going to schedule this for next time, is the graduation requirements because we have graduation requirements over and above state law. So do we want to just do state law in a virtual environment? Do we want to stick with these are still all the requirements? 
Um, so that was one Dr. Albin raised that, Jamie, is that something the policy committee and the board might want to look at um, if we continue to teach in a virtual environment all year? So that would be an example of one that was, you know, pulled out that it might be very yeah. practical and time sensitive for the board to look at wave change for the year. As soon as we start addressing individual items, then more just leap to mind. Oh, yeah. Like I know. <laughs> I know. Yes. So. Well, yeah, I mean, grades and the whole seat time thing, I mm -hmm. think, I mean, yeah. the seat time thing started last spring, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so we have to have. And it'll be interesting, too, to see what MSDE will do by way of issuing waivers or changes and. If anything. If anything, because <laughs> we had some challenges there. So, yeah, I think yeah. it'll. The only thing that um, I feel like. Um, that wasn't clear to me from this policy that I've been a little bit confused about, and I, I really just came to light because of COVID, is the um, the minimum GPA mm -hmm. um, to participate, and how that comes into play. Is that is there site based decision making involved in that anywhere? No. Okay, so that's, but right now that's on hold. Correct for these um, first semester activities and for if. If we are able to begin a competitive season, um, I believe all of our students will be will start off academically eligible. Okay. Yeah, that 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 regulation and that uh, 2.0 average has probably been in place since Mr. Kendra was in high school uh, yes. in Frederick County. <clears throat> okay. So, w what do we move forward with this, folks? Do we want to take it to a work session? Uh, first, or do we want to just go ahead and, and move towards consent again as we did the first one? What's your pleasure? I'm going to just, uh, I'm fine with consent too. I think that there is a lot of conversation in our community right now about homeschooling just in general. Mm -hmm. And I think that the the chatter that i continue to see from folks who are you know both reasonable and unreasonable um is that uh they want their homeschool we've had this conversation since i've been on the board right. they want their kids right. who are homeschooled to be able to participate in extracurricular sports mm -hmm. i don't think that's something we need to explicitly address um because i think it's part of our enrollment you know um mm -hmm. but i think it's a question we probably need to be prepared for if Mm -hmm. you know. uh, yeah, and we addressed it um, uh, with Mr. Schmelick um, uh, before, when he came before us for uh, trying to do exactly that. There are some things that, that are precluded. Uh, some of the extracurriculars uh, require that you are enrolled in a school in, according to the state to be able to participate. So those are, are out of the question. So it's, there is a category uh, I think that might be open, but um, many of the categories are, are, are closed. Uh, separate from us without uh, mm -hmm. us having to even look at them. But yeah, I, I agree that may come up. Did, did you want to make a comment? I was just going to say that Comar states that you have to be currently enrolled in the school to participate in interscholastic athletics. And our liability okay. insurance only covers active students as well. Because we, we, that is a big question, dual enrollment, can you access one or two of our classes? So we have, we have gone back and forth over the years relative to that. Um, and I know legislatively there have been bills proposed relative to that and have not prevailed, but I think it continues to be an important topic and questions, and we might see that come back up, you know. Yeah, in, in it goes through cycles. Well, yeah. I think, I, think I, I perceive that as we continue to flex the definition of what Mm -hmm. the, an enrolled student's day looks like right. or what enroll, you know, virtual learning or distance learning or continuity of learning or all the different ways mm -hmm. that people, you know, when, when students aren't in a building for six and a half hours or right. whatever, that it looks different to folks. And mm -hmm. I think those are the mm -hmm. questions that I think we mm -hmm. need to be, you know, we have the state definition, but. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so we'll move that to consent okay. also, and again, advise everyone that they can pull it and ask questions if they like. So the next policy is 413, and this is one that um, we are um, 
scheduled to review. Donna Quatman Wilder could not be here today, but she did review it and give input um, relative to just the language, and she had no concerns or objections to that. And again, this was just kind of formatting and updating, nothing that I would call substantive change. Although I think it, there was a significant statement that she added under community involvement. Mm -hmm. I think um, when I read this, the thing that seems to be almost missing a bit is mm -hmm. not just, it's the, the idea that um, family and community partnership is bigger than your child's education. Um, it's, it's the you know, involvement in the school community, it's involvement in the, the systemic you mm -hmm. know, county. And I, I think I would, would add that there so um, up in the purpose statement, Liz, where it yeah, says enables families to participate in their child's education? Well, the, the policy is about family and community partnership. And okay. we have many community partnerships with people who are not directly related to students as well. And they're valuable, too. Um, so I think, um, you know, family and community partnerships that support the you know, individual engagement and achievement of individual students and the success of um, public education in Frederick County. Just looking past, you know, just people who, mm -hmm. the individual kids. Yeah, because the policy statement does indicate the board acknowledges it's a shared responsibility of school, family, and community. And then I think we have community here. And so, yeah, it begs the, that it should also be encompassed in the purpose. I see what you're saying. Okay. I can make that edit. I, I think that's a good catch. Same direction then? Consent? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, with, with the addition of the community part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll work on that. Okay. Thank you. Field trips. Hmm. I have I believe a com and I don't want to speak for you, but was this a committee as well, Kathleen? I'm trying to resurrect my memory with the. Did did you have no, there, there are the only changes to this are really the purpose, the policy and the purpose statement, and then some of the um, references at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I had student transportation. Uh, I had a kind of a editorial question here about when permitted the condition specified. Sorry, this is under B. Mm -hmm. uh, when permitted the condition specified in subsection C apply. And then that's referenced again under E on page two. And subsection C is required field trips shall be offered at no cost to the student. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I understand the application in these two situations. So C on the first page, and I'm sorry, Mike, I. It's referenced again under uh, e, e in the uh, opening statement of E. Do not need to. All travel programs, class, or student organization trips which do not meet the conditions specified Let's in subsection C see. shall be vo viewed as non-school. I, I, this could be uh, uh, just stated a little clearer okay. for what it is we're trying to get at here. Under E? Uh, uh, both of them, with B, even with B, school-sponsored overnight. You're defining what school-sponsored is. So what's the point of having the last sentence? The last sentence under? B. Oh, B, okay, now you're B. Let's just deal with one at a time. Okay. I, 
I don't get it. But, you know, I'm slow, so I'm happy to take direction when, when well, it's given. And, no, I don't think it, I, I don't think, in, you know, A is kind of the purpose statement. Those three paragraphs in A don't really, they're not really part of the re, the the thing. They're kind of part of the why, okay. which is part of the purpose statement. I just mm -hmm. think it needs to be re reformatted. Um, yeah, and just trimmed and edited a bit. I because I, I'm not sure when permitted the condition specified in s subsection C just says required field trip shall be offered so at no cost. If you, if you're, yeah, so students don't pay money to go on field trips that are required in the curriculum. Right. But what is when permitted the conditions? I mean, all field trips that are required should be free. So B and C should be collapsed there. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I think, too, now that I'm looking at this, too, I think we have a lot of regulation language that might be better suited to link in the reg. Because this is a lot of detail for a policy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, as I'm looking at that now. So I think you're. The other question that I have is that um, I don't know that, I mean, it's been a while since my kids have been on a field trip, but I feel like I feel like the required field trips that my kids have been on, we've had to pay some money for. Mm. Like even Annapolis was a couple dollars. Am mm -hmm. I? I'm not sure that was a required field trip because that was my question as well. I and you here. know, the day the day we went with the second graders or whatever to I don't remember what grade, but the little ones to the science center of the aquarium. Mm -hmm. That was, I know that was some money mm -hmm. from every family. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know. Are those Sex. not part of the curriculum? Well, that's what my question was. What, my What's next the definition one, of a I, start, I started kid. off with the things that I didn't understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now I want to go to the second paragraph under A. School system offers systemically identified field trips. When I was a curriculum specialist, we had in our curriculum identified field trips, Schifferstadt for fourth graders. Okay. It was required, everybody went. But not everybody went in eighth grade to Antietam. Some people did, some people didn't. It wasn't systemically identified as a field trip embedded in our curriculum. Therefore, as Ms. Barrett pointed out, people would have to kick in five bucks to get the bus uh, or for lunches. Okay. So I want to know where and if we still have any systemically identified field trips mm -hmm. and where I could find them. That would be a link that should be uh, identified in there. Um, because that list, that list has changed so much over time and it goes back to when we used to have uh, foreign um, uh, excursions with our, our students. We used to send students to our sister city Mm -hmm. um, and we stopped doing all of that quite a few years ago. And we had a list of embedded trips that we paid for and were set up and, and supposed to be done within our system. And they disappeared when the economy tanked. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it was the last time the economy tanked or the time before that that the economy tanked, <laughs> but it's, they have disappeared uh, over time. I haven't seen that list. I would love to see it. I'd love to know if it still exists. And if it does, it should be identified within this. Okay. So I would like to send this back for some rewriting and uh, to take a look at, at what, what the actual process is so that uh, we're, we're dealing with the reality of our, 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 our school systems travel. Obviously, we do not do overnight travel programs. We have not done that mm -hmm. in years. And in the middle school, when we used to do uh, Camp Greentop, um, you know, that disappeared. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know that we have any. High schools do some overnight. High schools do have some. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know they have some uh, extracurriculars or co-curriculars uh, where they go as the band or they go as the chorus. I wasn't sure that there were any curricular related field Occasionally, trips. Occasionally, their FFA has a significant number of events related to um, their judging competitions and so forth. Good to know. Um, so high school, there are um, overnight trips. Anything that is extended day or overnight comes into the um, uh, directors. So that would have to come in for approval mm -hmm. um, by both the director and the executive director, depending upon the, um, the parameters of the field trip. I will say that um, certainly can go back and talk to CII 
to see what um, embedded, if there are any, where, is that list still in existence? Um, but I would also say that in addition to um, the dis discontinuing the international travel, um, the focus on the economic impact of field trips and the cost to families. We know that the folks that do some of those extended trips do fundraise for right. uh, covering the cost. And PTAs um, cover them. Yes, but we also have very, um, a very clear focus on instructional time. And so it is not uncommon to have an ongoing conversation with a school regarding what does the school calendar look like, what is the time your folks would like to be away, how does that impact students, and what's reasonable um, to make a request for, for any, any part of the school day that might be missed. All of that is the actual process that is in existence right now, mm -hmm. and I don't see that in this policy. Um, so I'd, I'd love to see a, a rewrite that at least reflects some of that. That'd be okay? Sounds like a committee. Yeah, yeah. Could I ask one question? Is the FFA, are those over, those potential overnights, um, are those extracurricular or are they field trips? They are um, both. Um, okay. it, a lot of the activities are considered co-curricular because the students in FFA are enrolled in agriculture sure. coursework and there are certain um, aspects of the program that are um, you know, land judging or mm -hmm. those sorts of things, and then the national convention. So it's very much a co curricular um, activity. Thank, Thank you, Ms. LaPelle, for all the information. That's important to get this right this time. Well, we have time. Yeah. So we can yes. take some time yeah. and we do. <laughs> we'll be doing yeah, some virtual <laughs> field trips this fall. Yeah, we so we time. will bring that back, and I'll work with Kathleen and I'll get some input from the curricular division as well and we'll bring that back i think the feedback has been very good thank you okay. very good. Um, i'm happy to i'm happy to pilot the first field trip just to all right, <laughs> all right. make sure the policy works okay as long as we don't charge you exactly um so the next one it really is just a recommendation of deleting policy 419 student arrival and departure time because it's kind of just hanging out there all by itself and we thought that it would make sense to incorporate that into 441, your transportation of students. And again, just for ease of information for uh, staff and parents to, to locate and understand. And we provided an update on the Comar references as well as um, a regulation that corresponds with it. Um, other than addressing the rest of the policy, which is not our purview at this particular time. Yeah. Do we have any issues with merging these Or good two? questions, because Fred's here. You have a good question for Fred. <laughs> I, I, the only question I had is, um, I know some teachers um, bring their own kids to school, mm -hmm. and they're not really teacher supervised, because the teacher may come in early to, you know, mm -hmm. um, do some work before school begins and their own child could be sitting in the classroom mm -hmm. reading a book or something is right. that are we covering that okay is that I just don't want to be in a situation where we're creating a potentiality for a principal to say you can't bring your kid in to sit quietly while you get your classroom ready right. sort of thing yeah I, yes that that does that does occur the intent here was that parent dropping students off or st students being by themselves not with another adult Okay. So if, if you think we need to clarify that, but you're right, in that example, we do allow that to occur. As, you know, because a lot of times, too, your child goes to that school and you're right. working in that school. So we have never prohibited. Or they're on the same campus like Walkersville yeah. or Middletown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was for unintended. And that's why we put it under parent responsibility versus employees. I mean, I, I guess I always just say, well, so the, it, I, I'm looking at the audience as parent of a student not mm -hmm. and oh you have to also be an employee because I do think that we do allow employees to do this because the child supervises and it's before the work day I think that's appropriate they are so acting do you think as, it, a, as no. a parent okay so that's their responsibility okay can we Con put that one on consent, consent? yes Agreed. all right so we'll delete one and merge it Brad really appreciate you being here Good theme. Yes. Thank, <laughs> thank, you. thank you for the information on the as we move forward with the electric buses. Thank you, sir.
<laughs> okay. Uh, now, Mr. Meninsky, I think you wanted to read public comment before the next item. Yes, we said we were going to in, in, infuse public comment here where it belongs. Okay, this, uh, this comment was from Hiba Hassanen, and it came in on August 18th. In response to a request I made, I received the following email response from Mr. Boffman, Executive Director of Public Affairs in May 2020. Quote, religious expression in a public school environment is governed by the U.S. Constitution and Supreme Court decisions related to separation of church and state and freedom of expression. In accordance with board policy 427.3, official neutrality regarding religious activity, school employees when acting in their official capacities are representatives of the state and are prohibited by the establishment clause of the First Amendment from soliciting or encouraging religious activity and from participating in such activity with students. As such, I have instructed the FCPS Public Affairs Department staff to refrain from communicating celebratory messages for any religious holidays going forward." End quote. I do not believe Board Policy 427.3, as written, prohibits FCPS from communicating celebratory messages for religious holidays. Also, Board Policy 427.4 .4 states, quote, teachers may teach about religious aspects of the holidays and schools may celebrate the secular aspects of holidays. The following changes below have been proposed to the religious expression policy, uh, among others. While I do not object uh, to these or other changes, I disagree with Mr. Boffman's interpretation of these policies, which cause them to instruct his staff to refrain from communicating celebratory messages for any religious holidays. And the changes that uh, uh, is referenced in there are in 427.3 as well as 427.4, .4, which are on um, board docs and are part of uh, our discussion today. Okay. So the changes that um, I propose, I think, is just making things a little bit more in the active voice and updating language relative to. Um, the constitutional standard as it relates to religious expression. So the policy statement says kind of the same thing, but I think just with a little bit more detail and information. And then um, the definition of proselytizing and religion was added. Um, and this was just something I collaborated on with uh, fellow attorneys. Every now and then we get together to just review policies. So some of the language and updates um, were collaborated on, I think, in particular, um, Howard County really had a very good example. So this is one that we confer with a good bit and, and compare, although not a lot happens um, from a constitutional law perspective uh, under the First Amendment. Uh, and case law is very strong and, and uh, gives some bright line tests in this area. But it is one that we do um, a lot of training. We get lots of questions on. So um, it is one that you know I think is important to update and provide that direction because it, it is accessed and used a great deal. Absolutely. Um, we have dealt with it a great deal in the curricular area. Yep. Um, we have uh, a section here that deals with our, our employees, school employees. It doesn't define uh, who those employees are and occasionally we've had um, uh, volunteers in our system that have not seen themselves as employees and therefore they have violated some of these clauses. Mm -hmm. uh, we had that last fall at a sporting event, and I wasn't sure if we needed to be more specific in that area. Uh, and addressing um, uh, the concern here about official neutrality, this is uh, actively participating in any such activity with students. Is our celebratory uh, nature of putting things in the calendar as well as uh, uh, allowing what social media we do have as, as part of FCPS is that actively participating in an activity with students is in your mind an interpretation in my mind no it would not be the Supreme Court analysis always goes to what's your motive and intent so if you list um, 
holidays or celebrations based on different religions? Is your intent um, to educate from a cultural perspective, to educate from a curricular perspective, or is your intent you want to promote religion? Right. And so that's what the Supreme Court analysis is. Do you have a secular, non-religious reason for what you're doing? Which is why, you know, in the calendar, if you say, well, we've listed Christmas, or you get Christmas off, or the winter holiday off, you're off because attendance, we know, would be, absences would be very high based on our culture. Um, because that's been deliberated at the court level. How can you let off for something that you call Easter or something? And the motive behind school systems should be, because we know if we were open on December 25th, 80% of our students wouldn't be there. So that's a very secular, non-religious reason why mm -hmm. we close school that day. So the same logic would apply. Is there a secular, non-religious motive of why you want to list them all on the calendar? It's to, and again, the identifying that teachers can see that if there's religious accommodations we should make for our students. Oh, I might get a request for accommodations during Ramadan. Oh, it's right there on the FCPS calendar, now I know it. Or, oh, curricular-wise, I'm gonna plan a lesson around that. Um, so it's neutral if your motive, you know, uh, but now it should be that, can you encompass all of those? And so that's the tricky part. So that's the other part. So you have to have that secular motive. You can't in excessively entangle yourself and you can neither promote right. or discourage religion. That's the three tests. That's the three part analysis test referred to as the lemon test that Supreme Court has said, school systems or government agencies, when you make decisions that are in the topic of religion, put it through these three things, A, B, and C. And the first one and the most paramount one is what's your motivation? What's the motive behind it? And then you're not encouraging or discouraging. And that's where let's make sure we address them all. Um, and so I've seen different school systems and government agencies handle it differently. Well, the Montana case this summer kind of ate away a little bit at the lemon test when uh, the court uh, supported textbooks, funding, and other mm -hmm. things that were part of the lemon test before, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they've supported changing that. So uh, that's mm -hmm. getting eaten away a little bit. Mm -hmm. my, my question really is, do we need to include anything in here or is there anything in here that precludes us from accomplishing what our community is, is asking for? No, and, you, and if you look in school systems, you'll see it both ways. You'll see, and, we've, and it used to be, we would list it if it was a day, a day off or something like that. Then the calendar changes, and this year it was a day off, next year it wasn't. So I thought, well, that, that, that's not always aligning up, which made me a little mm, you know, uncomfortable um, because before we'd say, well, we're listing it because it is a day off, because that's that, that's that secular objective. I'm showing you we're closing. It might be on Yom Kippur, but that's for attendance reasons, not let's celebrate it. And so I've seen, you know, the logic apply, and, and, it, and it, there's a, you know, rationale behind it. There, in my legal opinion, there's nothing in this policy that's preventing you from identifying those things on the calendar, but I would be fair and consistent in your application of it mm -hmm. and indicate that the purpose, what is your purpose to wanting to identify those on the calendar and make sure that it's curricular based. Um, educating our public. Ed ed educating the public, embracing culture and diversity, right. your equity policy, not to promote religion and right. celebrations of religion. And so, I'm so, just thinking from a social emotional perspective to, you know, for a student to see mm -hmm. his or her holiday recognized on the calendar. I think that that's mm -hmm. an important thing. Okay. So we have, we have two, we have two things that are, I think, just to get back to the public comment and there are two, I think amongst the policy committee, there's agreement that I think the calendar, the school calendar handbook, in all of its uh, <laughs> decades of glory, has mm -hmm. done a pretty good job of including yeah. holidays and celebrations mm -hmm. and, and when it that are both religious and cultural. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, so the specific request was that the school system use its um, social media to share greetings about holidays. 
And we know that in the past, holiday greetings have been shared for Easter, uh, for Ramadan, you know, and we know that at the school level, there's definitely, there's definitely, you can't get to December in an elementary school and not see a little Santa Claus action. There's just, it just doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, my, my kindergartner made a dreidel in kindergarten, and I, I mean, I, right. you know, and so there's kind of this balance, right? right. Um, and, um, and the dreidel example is a great example, Liz, so yeah. thank you for raising that. But I'm hoping um, that that teacher said these are all symbols of the holiday and yes. the culture in which yes. you can draw a dreidel, you can draw Santa, right. Frosty the Snowman, or the Nativity scene. That's yeah. that neutrality, that balance. Or the Kwanzaa candle. Yeah, I'm not yeah. encouraging or discouraging. I'm teaching you these are symbols of this month. Right. Or, yeah, yeah, and I yeah. think it was a good conversation about world religions, but, right. yeah. you know, but that doesn't happen... That happens in in December. You know, there's mm -hmm. not going to be that same. So um, I think that we agree that the calendar handbook mentions are great. Now, I don't think I think the language that showed up in the new red paragraph two on page one, okay. favor or exclude. So we've got we've got what happens for our kids in the classroom in terms of instruction. But we also have the role of the school system in the community and to create that welcoming environment to talk about social emotional stuff like Dr. Jarman said. And also we've been talking about cultural proficiency mm -hmm. and religion is within that circle diagram that we share with folks, your religion, your culture, um, all those things that make you that make you an individual and then part of the community. So I, I, I don't. Um, I think we you, the, the conversation is really are we going to send messages out on all religious holidays or no religious holidays and I, I think my my preference would be and if we need to codify it in policy that's fine but I do think we need to take a systemic you know it's not promoting it's not proselytizing to say Merry Christmas or you know um, you know Happy Easter or whatever the holiday is it's I think the guideline from the community was simply to send out a message for all the holidays that are listed in uh, the school calendar. Yeah. And if we just are consistent with that. If we list it in the calendar, we send out a message relating to that. Yeah, without, you know, without um, any, Well, you know. I would say if, and, and so I like the listing because, again, the intent and the motive, I'm listing them recognizing there's a diverse culture and recognizing you know that's part of teaching that but so using fcps social media platform to say merry christmas and happy easter well, it, could be viewed as encouraging it could be just find out first we we can se yeah. separate ourselves from social media because that will change over time but find out first is our way of addressing our community that signs up it's not going out to everybody in the world. It's only going out to those people that sign up for it. So if you are signed up for Find Out First, um, you will get a message about what is on our calendar. Well, on yeah, what's on the calendar, I'm fine, because again, that's tied back to your, I think, secular objective. But to encourage a celebration could be argued that you're encouraging a religious activity. Just simply to say happy whatever, period. So you're saying the, you're saying, <laughs> the implied verb of happy, like as in you have a happy Christmas or you have a happy Ramadan or a, a, you know a joyful whatever is, you're saying that's a celebratory message. It, it could be, or it could be viewed as I'm promoting. It's it is a happy occasion. Well, if I'm Jewish, that might not feel good. Right. Or if I'm atheist, that might not feel good. Um. But so that you can, one I you think can get off find out first then <laughs> or we can just simply say today is and whatever the holiday right. is and for all and those we and for all those folks that that celebrated. celebrate this um uh, we, we wish them a good day mm -hmm. we had such an interesting conversation about um juneteenth right yeah so we had community feedback that said hey you know we need the system to acknowledge juneteenth yeah and we need the superintendent to tweet about Juneteenth. Right. 
But then we got public comment that said, thank you for doing this. Thank you for acknowledging Juneteenth. But then we also got public comment that said, why are you using celebratory language mm -hmm. about something like this? And I thought that was interesting. That might not feel good to me. Right. Right. But right. I guess, you know, if, if we're literally equally acknowledging without favor or an exclusion, all of the holidays and celebrations or acknowledgements that are on the school calendar, I, I, think that's, I think that's the right thing to do. I think it aligns with our equity policy, it aligns with welcome and inclusion, it aligns with cultural proficiency. So how many world religions are there? Because, I mean, Mike, you taught oh. social studies, so if you think I'm saying happy and I wish you all throughout the year, and, and as soon as you miss one, it looks like you're showing favoritism. As soon as you miss one, this is what happens. This is what FCPS continuously does wrong, in my opinion. As soon as you miss one, you say, oh my goodness, that has never been on our calendar handbook before. We're really sorry, and we're gonna get it right next year. Okay. That's what we say. And that's how you say that we're not being, ex this is why we, how we get, we get out of this risk aversion mindset that we're gonna screw it up if we do it right for someone and we say you know what we're really sorry and I think that's what should have happened for the public comment or rather than this constitutional lecture you know it, it's 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 frustrating because we could we could easily become a more welcoming and inclusive right. if we go back to that family and community policy that we just mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. right. where we say we're going to have two-way conversations and we're going to welcome the public we're this is one. one of the best times to do it right. mm -hmm. if we've missed your holiday if we've missed your cultural celebration tell us you know, so that's then, what education's about. Right, right, right. So then, then my point becomes, we're talking about religion, but do things then like National Coming Out Day, um, because that's inclusive, does that go on the calendar? Does National Day of Silence go on the calendar? Because I remember having a discussion about inclusivity of the LGBTQ community and Pride Month being recognized. Um, because it is a national event. So I know the policy is related to religion. I know it's related to religion, but if we are talking about equity and if we are talking about presenting ourselves as a welcoming community, does that have a place as well? I don't, I don't know. I'm just well, at the, bottom of, at the bottom of the, each calendar handbook page are all of the, so February is Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, March is Women's History Month, right. February, February is African American yeah. or Black History Month. So, but it's also like, you know, we're not gonna do like, it's ice cream month, right? right. But you know, I remember asking everybody, could we just maybe send out a Pride Month announcement for the love of God, you know? Because um, we had just come off of the, 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 con the conversations about Black History Month and I'm not sure we got um, Women's History Month covered. But I, I think the but I don't know why that would be of the inclusivity of Pride Month is yeah. is important, um, and I think that it sends, you know, to to those students and those families who are members of that community. I think that it sends a welcoming message, and so so d does it go just a little bit farther from the religious content. I don't know, I'm just. Yeah, interested. I think it makes sense to tie all that stuff together because I think if we're gonna use the calendar handbook as the, as the resource book of celebrations and acknowledgements, I think that's a, great, that's a great thing because at the bottom of all those pages is you know maybe, so you set up your social media, you set up your find out firsts you know, to, um, you know, to say this is Women's History Month, this is, you know, I don't know. I, I think that ties in with curriculum really yeah, significantly. So Absolutely. So at the risk just, of not sounding like a constitutional lecture, and I'm sorry, because that is, that is kind of my default <laughs> and I love it. And so I didn't mean it to come across as I was giving you a constitutional no, lecture. No, no, not to us. I meant, oh. I meant the message that she referenced in her email because you know, as I took, I took two semesters of church and state in law school, you know, and I do think that we're overcomplicating this conversation a lot. Well, um, I only wanted to draw a delineation because there is a delineation on 
Pride Month and other activities, Day of Silence, right, right, because right. remember you have a constitutional amendment that says religion. So mm -hmm. okay. that's a separate conversation because you have a lot more latitude on topics like Juneteenth and things along those lines. The religion is not that I'm worried did I miss a religion on the calendar handbook, but did I offend somebody unintentionally? Um, and you're right, when that has been raised and we've said, you know, we'll certainly evaluate that. What? People, you know, give input in our office uh, regularly about, and we've revised and looked at regs and policies relative to that because we can't think of everything, but we need to consider that and so I, I would say those are two separate conversations I think um, the policy you, you want to make sure that you stay um, true to the policy because the policy is grounded in in, mm -hmm. in constitutional provisions right. it's important and it's significant relative to your calendar topic and listing um, holidays relative to that I think if it's fairly and consistently applied and the motive is not to encourage religion correct I'm not uncomfortable with it. The social media and the celebratory messages, I would just like to explore that a little bit more from a legal comfort mm -hmm. sure, sure, perspective. Sure, sure. I, and I, I just happened to think of it, so I, but I know I was out well, of place. No. So there's nothing in here that precludes us listing these things on the calendar, um, and there's nothing in here that precludes us from sending a find out first identifying the day. What's on the calendar? Uh, if it's on the calendar. Is there anything that we need to include in here to uh, clarify the issue that we are looking at major religions of the world uh, when we identify them for uh, the school system purposes? Hmm. Uh, that would limit the number of extraneous. We don't, we don't, not that I want to pick on them, but I don't think we want to celebrate Rastafarian uh, holidays. Um, because they've been actually a, a problem uh, in our country. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we do want to celebrate the major Abrahamic religions. Uh, we don't even want to limit it, major religions uh, on our calendar. So is there in your I mind wouldn't, anything? I would not recommend it, defining that it's going to be certain or world religions because students, depending on the religion, would be entitled to a religious accommodation. And we wouldn't say, but it has to fit in this category. So I wouldn't want to- Not major religions. Give okay. a wrong, wrong impression there. As long as in your mind, this does not preclude us from doing that, then we can work to make that happen. Yeah, I think we just need to use, um, I think we need to have language that says we're going to acknowledge um, without favor or exclusion. I think the language in the policy is, is very strong with favor or exclude. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just... Um, yeah, and so then your decisions kind of say, I'm, I'm aligned with what this says I can do or can't do. Yeah. Okay. And, and the why, I think we, if we tie back to our equity policy, if we tie back to the idea of cultural proficiency, if we talk, mm -hmm. tie back to welcoming and inclu inclusive schools, this is this is kind of what we have to do. I yeah, think. and that's yeah. the that's the right lane to be in from a constitutional perspective because the motive is not religion, it's much bigger. And, and right. you know, I appreciate the conversations that you've had and others have had. I think, you know, as the public commenter noted, I mean, Howard County really has this already rolled out. And I, I think that mm -hmm. if if staff is worried about this being a lot of extra work, I think following mm -hmm. the lead of that county for a good way to go, you know, in terms of rolling out announcements or whatever that, well, that are neutral. Well, and I've worked here for 20 years when I've seen it both ways, and it didn't create a lot of work, what yeah. I call. Does it create a lot of reaction? Yes, it does. Work, no. But reaction, yeah, yeah. but that's okay. I mean, the First Amendment says that's what's good for us. You mean, what do you mean by reaction? You mean well, the public saying, well, why well, are, just, you, are you going to say Merry Christmas? Because no, more along the lines of, well, if you close for this day, why can't you close for that day? Or you said this, but you didn't acknowledge that. And so anything political or religion will get a reaction, and I don't yeah. know that that's a bad when thing. When we had Im the imam come and speak to uh, mm -hmm. many of our students, um, that was problematic with some of our community. Yes, I remember um, but that. It was, uh, but it was the right it was thing educational to do. educational activity. Yeah, it was. I mean, and we, were, we were talking about world uh, mm -hmm. religions and preparing mm -hmm. our students mm -hmm. uh, to look at uh, AP world history and mm -hmm. um, 
and compar religious comparisons. So it was, it was appropriate, um, just as it would be if we had a, a priest and a rabbi come and debate mm -hmm. uh, their, their topics. Um, but it does create some friction sometimes uh, within the community. Mm -hmm. I get that. But that, like I said. So can we move this to consent? I don't know. Do you guys feel like you want to have a bigger conversation with the board because you're thinking of other things? Or I, I don't think the changes are anything. I, I think our, no, I think the changes are fine. I just want to make sure that we're pulling the lever right now or we're, we're capable of pulling the lever to have this, the public commenters issue remedied. Yes. Which is, right. I, I don't, are I we think able to do that as three people? Because I guess the concern that I have is I don't feel like, I don't feel like the policy, I don't feel like the policy ever precluded what she asked for. I right? agree. And so I think if I were to ask again, I think the communication back to the public comment or in any commu future communication that goes to our community needs to be clear and, um, you know, in this case, include an apology for all of the back and forth and confusion. Because mm -hmm. I think that's not think the way we welcome folks to um, conversation and community. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we are pulling that lever and that, you know, if there is a religious world holiday next week that I don't have on my radar, that we're going to send a find out first about it. So my recommendation would be to place this on consent within a recommendation that next year's calendar handbook provide for the religious holidays that are identified and indicate the reason too. And that way then, I mean, if you feel like I would view it, Liz, as one option you could do, Mike could do as a policy committee update at the board, yes, that the I'll, policy committee talked about this, this is where we'd like to go, does anybody have any objections? And that way it gets. I'll be doing that this, after, this evening or okay. afternoon or I mean, that's one do. option. I don't think it requires a board vote to change your calendar handbook. I don't think the calendar handbook is wrong. I don't think the calendar handbook no. leaves no. anything out. But I think you're showing that you have a recommendation. We're occasionally told, as you pointed uh, out, yeah. that we leave, leave, leave something out. But we always add it back in the next year or put it in the next but year. But I'm saying I don't. the calendar handbook has had the, – the issue is that the find out first have been inconsistent. Well, there's some inconsistencies now with the acknowledgement of holidays in the calendar handbook because that's when okay, I we didn't. received the question. Then I looked to see well, which okay. ones are we identifying? Oh, okay. it's only on school days off. Well, that one wasn't. So okay. I think we want to make sure we consistently acknowledge yes. that even if it's not a school day off. Those are the two things that we, that this committee, I believe, wants to move forward with and that I will express this afternoon when I give our update on the policy committee. And okay. You, expectation is that we'll, it will move forward with staff okay thank you thank you okay mm. uh, <laughs> yeah what's next oh no it's yours <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> CAC C yes the citizens advisory committee council um, Wow, we went. We we have looked at this for a long time. We had a report from uh, the f the president of the last uh, committee before us as a board in this room uh, quite a while ago. We looked at uh, trying to figure out how we wanted to move forward. We put together a series of questions. I believe Miss Barrett wrote up a bunch of them uh, that we put forth at a work session mm -hmm. in December. They were written November 25th, 2019, that addressed the what, the who, and the when mm -hmm. uh, of the committee. We looked at Carroll County Public Schools and Howard County Public Schools uh, versions of how their um, Community Advisory Council worked, or Citizens Advisory Council, different names in different areas. And I put together from um, the information and feedback that I got at the work session um, the, the following uh, paper. It's not posted on board docs, but it will be after uh, this meeting, I believe. Um, or I will ask for it to be, so you can look for it later. The Citizens Advisory Council, this is based on feedback from our work session on December 11th shall consist of two representatives from each feeder pattern appointed by the uh, PTA or PTO or whatever acronym we want to use in conjunction with the principals or by principals appointment if there are limited uh, active PTAs. 
one board li member liaison, one representative appointed by Frederick County Association of Student Councils, so we have a student in there, one representative from each of the three bargaining units, and the superintendent's designee. Uh, the term of office, we, one of the, the pieces of feedback we got was that everybody's term of office ended at the same time. And so we had a whole new council coming in um, each time if, if people um, wanted to run again. So in this instance, uh, I tried to just use some verbiage to stagger the terms. That's the whole point uh, for term of office is to have the first year, one half the council will have a three-year term and the other half have a two-year term. All terms of office shall be two years after the second year so that one half of the council remains from the previous term. Mm -hmm. uh, or any other way that we can, uh, any other better verbiage uh, to figure out staggered terms of office. And then the charge uh, for what they would do, um, we had uh, a lot of discussion during the uh, work session that dealt with rather than them coming to us with a series of recommendations uh, on uh, prescribed dates throughout the year, that we would ask them to uh, seek ideas from the public to address topics of interest uh, related to education of students in the county so that they could uh, look at that themselves, to gauge public opinion on topics related to public concerns as they see fit in a timely manner. Now, if it's the PTA, they have access to uh, gauge public opinion uh, in a variety of ways. Um, prepare information on topics and issues raised by the board. In that instance, if we uh, asked them for something, we could do that. And to research topics related to the education of students in uh, Frederick County Public Schools within the community, including but not limited to surveying public opinion. And lastly, bring information, public opinion, and research to the board during regularly scheduled board meetings as necessary instead of uh, setting up that um, artificial you will report to us twice a year uh, or at the end of the year. Uh, the board liaison will report to the Board of Education during uh, committee reports at every board meeting. This was to help make sure that the board was updated on their activities and to allow the Citizens Advisory Council to see that they were being um, uh, uh, they, they were being observed and that they were being uh, commended for their activities and to give them some more guidance if, they, if we felt they needed it in the direction in which they were going. So um, my, my question, my first question for my colleagues and for uh, uh, the system is does the Career Technology Center have a PTA, PTO, or are they listed, they're not, I don't know if they're listed under a feeder pattern or not but I wanted to make sure that they would be represented in here and they might need a separate person. Other than that, um, I'm open to suggestions <laughs> from my colleagues uh, on how to move forward with this or, or what this says and edit this and then we'll figure out how to move forward. Ms. Barrett? I think you did a great job. Um, I think uh, I didn't go back and watch the whole conversation. Um, I've, I've, I watched part of it a while ago as we were thinking about the CAC. Um, I think this group is only going to be as effective as, in terms of giving us current information as we um, kind of like uh, include them and um, show that we've traditionally given them like big research projects right and that we haven't been able to fund you know we, we give them the research project because we're interested in there's a kind of a feeling that folks are interested in going this direction and then we have some giant hump you know hump in the road um i really like the um getting back to having sort of community feedback that's synthesized that we hear. And the only thing that I think that I would, um, I think the PTAs are having a really hard time right now in general. I think the, the county PTA is having some challenges recruiting local PTA members to the county PTA. Um, and I think there is a different necessarily um, 
the PTA sometimes includes people who may have more time on their hands than other parents. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wish there was a way to get a group of people involved who we don't always are not always involved and hear their voices. And I just don't know how that is. Um, but the other thing is to um, include the ombuds in this somehow, because I think her role is community and it's uh, engagement. And I think if she had real time access to um, listening to this group of folks talk about, you know, best practices or challenges in their commu school communities, that might be good information for her as well. And good information where she could, um, you know, um, avail herself to communities as well. That would be my only suggestion. And how would we phrase, where would we phrase that? And how would you phrase it? Well, I think that she would be a, I think that she would be a great member of the community, a member of the group, you know, a non, I mean, this group isn't going to be voting as it is, right? Right. Well, they're not, they're not. Own, they'd have to write their own bylaws for how they're going to work things out. They can look at the old ones and use those as an example if they like, but uh, we, we won't so direct them in that. They, they would still research topics, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if we if we if we had an ombuds report that said, "Hey, there's perceptions of issues with, um, gosh, I don't know, walking routes in this set of communities." I mean, is that something that she could help, you know, carry out to the CAC or? I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think about. I know we're going to have a board liaison. And a superintendent's designee. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know if we, should we identify a position as on there permanently or as a resource or, yeah. uh, that's why I was asking about verbiage, how, how should we define that? Um, and I don't know what our parameters are. I think that I was thinking about the ombuds because if you have a group like this, mm -hmm. it can move very quickly to like an individual kind of gripe session. And wow, that's important conversation in terms of problems, solving problems, having somebody with the systemic ear to the ground who's able to say, oh, well, that's a similar situation to, in her head, right? Because she works confidentially, but, you know, is able to connect the dots and say, okay. So, and then maybe able to go back and kind of Well, she works confidentially, resolve. but she does give a public report. Yeah, but so able helps. to, you know, uh, resolve some of the. Uh, well, could we request that the ombud, uh, ombuds participate as a systemic resource? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. The right and does that it. go down under the, uh, that's um, the superintendent will designate a staff yeah. member? Is is the superintendent designated staff member the ombuds? Well, no, you don't want to do that. Uh, I'm not, not going to. I'm not going to usurp the superintendent. Well, no, she's not a staff member. She reports to the board, and oh, so that's okay. a clear gotcha, member, gotcha, so that I people really view her neutrally. I get it. Okay, but I think Sabrina would be very good. I do too. Um, so I will I think she should then I need we, we need to add that as another bullet uh, that the ombuds uh, participate as a systemic resource. I was looking for Sabrina because she asked me if she could come today. Oh. So. Does anybody know if Career Tech has uh, is I in a don't know. I pattern? can find that out for you. Because I would like them to have a representative there or at least be under the uh, Faye, can you email the feeder the patterns because that's. They're just kind of out there, yeah. and they, they hit all the feeder patterns, and I don't think that's appropriate. I think they need their own, if they want. Mm -hmm. uh, term of office, uh, Dr. Jarman, Ms. Barrett, uh, staggered terms of office for two years. Is that okay, however we phrase it, a yeah, staggered term, consistent. two staggered, years? Yes, I think it needs 
I think a two year commitment is really a big ask. And yeah. I think it's the farthest we can go. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I, mean, I originally asked. For I don't know more. what I'm doing next week. I originally week, wrote so. more in there, and I said, no, I can't yeah. do that. No, <laughs> we'll not have anybody doing it. So well, the two. concern that, I, sure. not to go back to the where we already just talked about, but I really think that we need to, if we're going to have representatives from feeder patterns that have students in the system, we really also need to, if you've got a kid, they, we need to. Vi shake up the levels a little bit you know mm -hmm. yeah so we can't have the the concerns of kindergarten parents versus yeah. well, know, we're parents having, of somebody at, at ctc or dual enrollment or and just, that's why i put two representatives from each feeder pattern we can de uh, designate one elementary and one secondary oh yeah that way we have 10 representatives from the 30 elementary mm -hmm. schools and on f and 10 representatives from the what 24 25 secondary, secondary. schools yeah mm -hmm. would that be okay i think so yeah because during the discussion in december it was just you know representatives from feeder patterns yeah but we didn't have a number and i wanted to make sure that we had you know more than 10 and that the elementary was represented so representatives from each feeder pattern and somehow or other i trust that um faye will get in there um, elementary, one elementary, and one secondary. Yeah, I got it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm envisioning this will now get linked into your policy, just like you have other links that now identify the detail. Unfortunately, the the waves that come out of this are going to affect our website. They're going to because that's where the, the uh, mm -hmm. description is. Yeah. It's going to affect our policy. Yeah, that's um, okay. So that's, yeah, there's going to be. That's how we've a, done other committees, Mike. So here. that makes sense. Okay. Any other? Any other issues with this? So can we take this to a work session? Yes. And so Mike, for the work session, do you want me to then go show the policy, show the new language in the policy, then link this in so it would show just like it would show in, in the policy and then to, to, to If you can do that, that, that'd be great. Well, I can't, but <laughs> Faye does everything. <laughs> that would be wonderful, yes. Uh, that was more than I wanted to ask well, you for. You know how we link in the bylaws of like CCAC or other ones? You can do that like nothing, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> I can't, but. <laughs> this file keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, and I'm just glad that we've moved to... forward. <laughs> Me too. We, this is a group that we could have used this yeah. past year. Yeah, a, no, I like a lot. it. And all right, I so really we're going to put that on work absence. session, and we're going to link in your guidelines. And I had a lot of guilt over not getting this forward faster because we could have used it, and it, it is unfortunate. All right, and I have your edits. Okay. So. Okay. Policy, work session, and link so. to this info. Okay. Now, Mike, you also wanted me to draft um, a new policy for discussion on teaching controversial subjects. So I did pull from yeah, a couple that, other counties, and I did ask. That didn't get posted, though. I think I just gave it to you because yes, I didn't did. know if you wanted to have time for people to look at it. I did get feedback from Colleen Bernard. I did research other counties, but it is a very rough draft. But that's a big conversation, and so I didn't know if your preference was we can send it to the policy committee and that be our first item we start with next time or if you want needed a little bit more time with it well um I, i'd like to c kind of discuss the background a little bit for why um, i asked for this and what um how i would want it to move forward but i'd like miss jarman to hear it so okay if we can hang on for just a moment I, i'd appreciate it so i don't have to do this twice and uh also because I know that uh, the gods in the sound room can edit things out, like that statement. Okay. So as a, a social studies instructor and then as a curriculum specialist in social studies, um, I have dealt with many, many controversial issues, uh, both teaching myself and dealing with uh, secondary instructors and dealing with um, 
principles in dealing with the community um, in terms of religion, which we, we just discussed, and I had many conversations with Ms. Cannon over that over the years. And objects um, that are visually uh, uh, abhorrent to many people that are part of the artifacts of our history as well as the history of the world. Um, we oftentimes, and we wrote a policy a while back about bringing in uh, artifacts into the schools. We had to do that because we had uh, weapons coming into our schools, so, uh, sabers, bayonets, if you're teaching World War II, um, Springfield rifles, if you're teaching World War I. Uh, we had a Springfield rifle from the Civil War in our building, and someone in the community saw the young man walking into our building with it, and we had the police in my room in a matter of five minutes. Um, and so we have had to deal with these things uh, over the years. Recently, recently, feels like years ago now, we had a problem in the community, an issue in the community arise with the uh, Nazi flag uh, being seen uh, by the public. We had um, uh, Ferguson a few years ago, um, I was the curriculum specialist, and we had to deal with um, issues. Uh, as I was growing up, um, I was a child of the 60s, and the civil, civil rights movement was current events. Uh, it was something that we discussed in our schools all the time. And so, uh, you know, when Bloody Sunday happened, we talked about it in my classroom, um, and I was a student. So I expect, as a teacher, to be able to discuss um, the movements of our society today. And I expect my teachers to be able to uh, address them with neutrality, with compassion, with understanding. And I'm not, I want to make sure that we as a school system have a policy that addresses the teaching of those issues so that our teachers have guidance, for one thing, uh, and they, they know what their boundaries are, because everybody needs boundaries. And, and, and we also need to make sure that they are protected. Uh, in, in their academic freedoms in being able to do this. So that was my impetus to asking about this because of, of the issue that occurred uh, last year. Uh, Ms. Cannon did speak with uh, uh, Colleen Bernard, who is the current social studies curriculum specialist, and she sent to me uh, the Washington County Public Schools uh, policy on this, on teaching controversial issues, as well as the Baltimore um, County Public Schools teaching controversial issues, and a, uh, a segment from the Howard County Public Schools labeled teaching of controversial issues. We don't have uh, something like that uh, in our school system. We do have academic freedoms. We do have some policies uh, that, that give our teachers uh, some protections uh, in dealing with that. So my question to my two colleagues here is do we want to move forward with looking at a, uh, a policy and a uh, correlating regulation um, that would deal with defining controversial issues, uh, with deal with standards of when a controversial issue um, is is you know uh, being addressed, the issue has political, economic, or social significance, and is presented within appropriate curricular guidelines um, uh, in, as part of the reg. For us in the policy area, we would look at discussing the treatment of the issue in question be within the range, knowledge, and maturity and competence of the students because I've addressed over the years many times that we don't deal with uh, deep dive issues with elementary school students and in middle school we have to be very, very careful because of the, um, uh, the, the mental competence of the students, the emotional competence of the students, and the social emotional uh, reaction to the issue itself. So uh, our policy would just ask teachers follow uh, approved criteria for determining the appropriateness at each of the grade levels and uh, make sure that the materials that are presented are reasonable uh, and it uh, pertains to the aspects of, this, of the topic that is under discussion and that it is um, appropriate to the curriculum. I didn't put it, we didn't put any limitations in this initial rough draft on when things could come up. There were some uh, issues with the, uh, the flag situation that it had been up for a while, and, it, and yeah. even though the, you know, there was a class that's a World War II class, that's a whole semester. So if, it's, if 
the te if you're teaching World War II and these flags are to represent the, the World War II and you're doing it the whole semester, can the flag stay up there the whole semester? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a controversial thing, so we don't address that necessarily in this rough draft of the policy uh, or the reg. So I think it's something that we would uh, want to take to a, a work session, but I, I want to know if you guys want to move forward with doing this with us first and then go to a work session, or would you like to not deal with it at all uh, at this time because we have so many other things we're dealing with? Um, or no, I, I think I think that we should deal with it because I think that it ta you know it's it's. Um, if, if nothing else, it's a protective measure for staff and, and to give some guidelines. Um, but I'm wondering if some sort of form should be given to it here in committee before it goes to the board for a general discussion. I, I mean, I just, because um, you can open, I don't know. I just, I just think maybe a little more guidance before it's brought up. Well, something in writing has always been important to me. Which right, is, right. And, so. I, and I think just to have something to work on to begin this, a conversation with might be helpful. But yes, I do agree that something, you know, we need to, to take some steps. I agree. I, I am not, um, this is one of those moments where I feel like, uh, that the policy committee should address it and should um, take those first steps. But I do feel a little bit like we may need, um, we may need some help and help that's not exactly like us because I feel like I could walk into a classroom with a Nazi flag on the wall and um, understand that for the next couple of months we're going to be talking about World War II and still find it completely unsettling every day mm -hmm. and unnecessary to have it up as a student. Um, and, you know, a Confederate flag. I mean, you were talking about mm -hmm. the Civil War. That wasn't... So I guess having diverse student perspective in this conversation because I do think that academic freedom is really important. I think there's the word artifact is a little bit overused in public education and higher education right now like the you know everything's an artifact you know uh, and defining those terms is going to be important. I just um, I just you know, everybody's going to write this, everybody's going to approach this in the vacuum of your experiences and your feelings, right? And I started so that way. <laughs> it's really hard. So I think one thing that's always striking is that when we're talking about, for example, if we're talking about issues of race or um, economic class or sexual orientation, a lot of times issues of race get called controversial, right? And we're supposed to be getting better at those conversations, and we're supposed to, as white people, <laughs> um, be able to say, okay, we're more comfortable listening to issues of, you, you know, talking about the civil rights movement in the 60s. And I, I guess the word controversial, like, you know, portions of all of our identities are not controversial, whether it's disability or, you know, they're important, and labeling them contentious kind of sets up, or controversial kind of sets up, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, it sets yeah. up that. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 think our, I think a lot of our kids today are past that a little bit, you know? And some of them, for sure, are not. Mm -hmm. right. But the ones that are, are like, you know, why is this a thing? And I, I think that that's, that's the whole Frederick County community. Those are, so I, I wanna do this, but I, doing it in work session seems even worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I also, you know, people like Mia, you know, how, how can we get a student perspective in here too? Because, yeah. you know, what does it feel like to sit in a class you know, because 
you know, it might feel different to talk about civil rights. You know, we, we've heard student experiences where you're talking about the civil rights movement or you're talking about, and if you're at a school where you might be the only kid of color in the classroom, everybody's like, well, what do you think about that? You know, that happens. So that's like classroom management, that's cultural proficiency. That's not just the stuff that's on the page, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's all part of this. It is. So encapsulating that in a policy seems really big to me and a big project, which I'm happy to take on with the policy committee. But I, knowing all the things I don't know, I just wonder how we can, we can really check our work. When we talked about the Racial Equity Committee, yeah. we brought many, many people together. I don't think we can do that physically at this point, but I do think we can uh, elicit public community family partnerships, yeah. uh, some responses in relation to this as, as we move forward at the same time, that we look at some of these, uh, this verbiage and post some of the verbiage and just as we ask for community feedback on the calendar, um, we, mm -hmm. uh, we can ask for community feedback in, in this uh, from our students uh, mm -hmm. and our teachers. Um, well, and if you want to put it on a future policy committee meeting, I mean, we can invite in the student board member, if she's available. I mean, I don't know what her schedule is, as well as a couple curriculum specialists, and maybe, you know. I'd like to invite the, uh, just to some of the students from uh, across the school system, just as we did when we were looking at the, uh, yeah. the uh, dress code. Yeah. We got students from a variety of schools and that gave us a better perspective because they didn't, mm -hmm. they, they, they don't all think alike. <laughs> well, we could and set that up as a good. virtual meeting, you know, and invite, you know, if, I mean, I don't know how time sensitive it is, but, uh, you know, I think it's a great I, topic that we could figure I out. I want how it to done get by input. December when I roll off the board. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think if we're going to, I think we need to give people, I, I, I think. While that would be a great discussion, I think we need to give people something to respond to. Yeah. Yes. Right. Oh, absolutely. So, and then say, you know, we, we need to work on this. Yeah. And get yeah. And ourselves, then have like a and then have the community respond. Exactly. Should we do? I mean, because it sounds like you've 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 written. Well, we something. have something. Yeah. I think yeah. we have a good starting. Should we do place? like round robin editing by email with it, and um, and then come back in a month? Absolutely. Uh, and try to finalize and figure out who we want to review it. Can we do that by email? Sure. I think okay. I, I can. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, Sept Wednesday, September 23rd is our next meeting. Um, are you all comfortable? And thank you, thank you, thank you for coming in today. Um, but are you both comfortable with coming back here and meeting in person that sure. day? Sure. Sure. If the world doesn't end between now and then. As long as, as, long as this is the way. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to invite maybe Colleen Bernard just sure. for that conversation and um, maybe the, the language arts. Uh, well, if, if we could have two or three curriculum specialists that have a lot of experience in this area, Mike, who would you recommend well, that we invite? I, I know it's, it's unusual, but science had some issues oh, a while yeah. back with uh, uh, dealing with um, well, maybe evolu I'll evolution. Yeah, that's true. Um, that. that was a problem. Uh, and we had to deal with super controversial and books and language it arts. was and yeah. books and Harry language Potter arts. series yeah. um, I mean I could always just toss it to Dr. Cuppet and say we'd like we're we have space for you know a couple of curriculum specialists but mm -hmm. Colleen would be you know because she has worked with me on this but I'll get back with you on that as we do agenda setting yes, I will and, and hold we, up the whole group after that and if so it's in your mind after that when we get some verbiage, we're going to want to do a, yeah. uh, a meeting with, with students across the county. Yeah. So we will have to, unfortunately, dump that on Colleen as well, or ask for her yeah, assistance ask for is her what assistance. I meant. Ask for her assistance. All right, that sounds like a great plan. All right, from so a, a little from column B. Mike, do you want Faye to send that to the policy committee? And because she has it in Word, yeah, and that way they can edit it and give back to her. Or do you want that? Would do be it? great because I wrote on mine, so right. if, I, if I made a scan of it, they'd see my writing. Yeah, we did a draft policy and a corresponding reg, so yeah. we'll send both. Okay. I have both of those, as well as please do the others from Washington County, Howard County, and Baltimore mm -hmm. County as we'll well. We'll give those samples. 
all of it. Give, give them everything that was sent to me, because I went through it all, yeah. and I thought, okay, this is a real good beginning, but I don't know where uh, Dr. Jarman and Ms. Barrett want us to go, so I didn't want to do and anything else. They will alert Kevin, I don't know where I want to be special about <laughs> September 23rd. Okay.